in an electrifying face-off. Today, we're going to pit the 1975 Altair 8800 with 32K against a monster 32-core Threadripper 3970X in a prime number deathmatch. With no quarter given and none asked, each machine will be challenged by a gauntlet of prime number crunching that would make the NSA salivate. We'll race the machines both head-to-head -head and against the clock to settle once and for all which is the most powerful desktop computer, the Threadripper or the Altair. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Here on my workbench, I've got two machines that couldn't be seemingly more different. My fresh restoration of a great Altair 8800 and the Threadripper 3970X that I've been daily driving for a couple of years. I wanted to introduce the Altair to you today and what better way than to see its lights blinking furiously as it does its best to fend off the modern Challenger. But can the old Altair hold a candle to the modern Threadripper? Well, there's only one way to find out, and that's to benchmark them on the same task. And so that's precisely what we're going to do. The Threadripper features 32 cores, 64 processing threads, and 128 gigabytes of RAM. But the Altair isn't showing up unarmed either as it features dual 16K memory expansion boards, all controlled by 25 front panel switches. The Threadripper only has one switch. Can it compete? Well, there are two things that run constant on the technical side of my life. Tempest and prime number sieves. You see, whenever I learn a new language or even tinker with a new system, one of the first things I write is a prime sieve. I know the pattern well enough by now that I can simply focus on the language or the platform, so it's a handy programming problem to work with. And about two years ago now, I wrote a prime sieve in C++, C Sharp, and Python, and then drag raced them on the same hardware to compare the languages. I uploaded those three solutions to GitHub, and pretty soon it had taken on a life of its own. People optimized my existing solutions and added new ones in various languages from Ada and APL to Rust and Zig. Today there are over 200 solutions in almost 100 different languages, all lovingly maintained on GitHub by folks like Rutger and Tudor, without whom the project could never have evolved as it has. Be sure to check it out in the video description. For the first tests, we're going to enforce a run what you brung rule, which means that the Altair will be operating in Microsoft's very first product, Basic for the Altair. Now, you might cry foul because the Threadripper will be running native C++ code, but if the Threadripper does manage to somehow eke out a win, we'll up the ante by making the Threadripper run the very same Basic 2.0 interpreter. If you've never seen a Threadripper running Commodore 64 Basic natively, you're in for a treat, so stay tuned. It's time to meet our first competitor, and it's the Altair 8800, released in 1975 by a company named Microinstrumentation and Telemetry Systems, or MITS. The Altair is often hailed as the world's first personal computer. When it hit the scene, it was nothing short of a revolution. This wasn't a monstrous mainframe stashed away in some corporate basement. It was a machine for enthusiasts, hobbyists, and early adopters of the burgeoning home computer era. MITS was a small Albuquerque-based company initially involved in the model rocket market, but by the early 1970s, it had shifted its focus to calculators. The next logical progression was into the world of personal computers. The Altair wasn't designed to be a super consumer-friendly machine like the later Apple II or Commodore PET. Instead, the Altair was a bit of a challenge, a kit which you had to assemble yourself. Those iconic front panel switches weren't for show. You had to use them to enter machine code directly into the computer in binary. But what made the Altair 8800 truly significant was an anecdote involving two young computer enthusiasts named Bill Gates and Paul Allen. They recognized the immense potential that the machine had. However, they also realized that to unleash the Altair's capabilities, it needed a more accessible and usable software framework. In late 1974, Powell Allen was browsing magazines at a newsstand and came across an issue of popular electronics that would change the course of technological history. On the cover was the Altair 8800, touted as the world's first microcomputer kit affordable and accessible to hobbyists. Recognizing the immense potential of this machine and the broader implications for the world of personal computing, Allen excitedly rushed to share his discovery with his close friend and fellow computer enthusiast, Bill Gates. The two had been looking for an opportunity to break into the burgeoning tech industry, and this was the moment they had been waiting for. Their vision and foresight led them to see that software would be essential for the Altair and similar machines. This realization spurred them into action, kickstarting a partnership that would eventually give birth to Microsoft and redefine the realms of personal computing. Gates and Allen approached MITS with a proposal they could develop a version of the basic programming language for the Altair. Working day and night and using Harvard's PDP-10 mainframe for simulations and emulation, 
the duo created the first version of what would become Altair Basic. They flew to Albuquerque and, legend has it, coded in flight and debugged the software in the MITS office. Their Basic was a hit. Not only did it make the Altair a more usable computer, but it also marked the start of a new company, Microsoft. The giant that gave the world Windows and Office began with two guys writing a version of BASIC for the Altair 8800. MITS was not just a computer company. With the success of the Altair 8800, it became a symbol of the democratization of computing. Before the 1970s, computers were huge, expensive, and inaccessible. With the introduction of the Altair and similar machines, computing was now within the reach of ordinary people, or at least the hobbyists. The Altair 8800 created a ripple effect in the computing world. Computer clubs began to spring up across the United States with enthusiasts sharing programs, tips, and even their own hardware modifications. This communal approach to computing, in a way, paved the way for the open source movement that we know today. Unfortunately, the code that they were actually sharing the most, illegal copies of Microsoft Basic, wasn't open source at all. This angered Gates, who wrote a testy open letter to the community with his logic being that if people didn't get paid to write code, they wouldn't write that code in the first place, so it was in the community's interest to stop stealing the software. However, the Altair's reign was short-lived. By the 1970s, more user-friendly computers like the Apple II started to dominate the market. But the Altair's legacy was undeniable. It had sparked a computing revolution and paved the way for the PC era. So here we are with two of the most iconic machines from different eras side by side. While the Threadripper is a testament to how far we've come in terms of raw computational power, the Altair represents the pioneering spirit of early computer enthusiasts. I found this Altair on eBay and it was very well preserved but fairly dirty. It had tape and glue residue and needed a quick bath to get it spruced up. Under the dirt and grime, however, it was remarkably original and well preserved. Once I had it clean enough to work on, I discovered that there was no power making it out of the power supply. It's actually fairly tough to reach it on the Altair, at least if you want to be able to probe the backside of the power supply PCB, and so the whole machine had to come apart. I found a broken wire under the power supply, likely the reason for which the machine had ultimately been retired. I soldered that connection back up, and the machine powered right on up. The Altair's motherboard is different from what we are accustomed to today because it's just a bus or a backplane. There's no CPU. The motherboard itself is just a set of four or eight interconnected bus slots, and the CPU can be found on a daughter card that plugs into one of the slots. Let's have a look at the hardware that goes inside the Altair. The first card that we'll install is the CPU card that I just mentioned. It's a gold PCB with a ceramic white Intel 8080 chip. The 8080 is what truly kicked off the PC revolution, and this one appears to be the factory original. No doubt worth a fair bit today on its own. Below the CPU, you'll find a row of buffers and line drivers that couple the CPU to the bus, which was a standard known as the S100 bus. Everything that the CPU does that touches memory or a peripheral will be done across the Altair's backplane bus. To get started, I'll insert the CPU card into the machine by plugging it into the backplane. We simply slide it down between the rails and push it evenly into the slot. I generally install the CPU card in the first slot, but I'm fairly confident that all the slots are equal and the order doesn't really matter. The next card I'm going to install is actually brand new. It's a replacement for the original Altair floppy controller known as the FTC Plus. This version, however, incorporates a fully compatible floppy controller along with a serial port, EEPROM, and RAM. Each of them is selectable by dip switch, so you can enable just the features you want. It's made by FarmTech, and I'll put a link in the video description. I'll be using it just as a floppy controller for now, but if I run into problems with the RAM or ROM of the machine itself, I can selectively replace them with memory from this board in order to troubleshoot things. It also contains a bootloader in ROM for the floppy drive, which can be incredibly handy. So let's get the FTC Plus installed. I'll follow the exact same procedure for each of the cards, simply installing them in the order that makes the most logical sense to me. CPU, ROM, I.O., and then RAM. That means my next step will be to install the 88 RMB card, better known as the Microsoft ROM Basic card. This card contains the 16K cassette basic in a set of eight EEPROM chips. These chips are labeled P8316E, and I wasn't able to find out very much about them. I'm curious what chips I could potentially use in this board that would be compatible with the 8316s that I would be able to burn in a standard TL866 EEPROM burner, or even with Martin's 2716 programmer. If you know how I could go about it, please let me know in the comments. You might just save me a lot of head scratching. I'll pop in the basic card next into the next available slot. 
It always maps itself into memory as C000, and that doesn't seem to be configurable, so I presume the code itself is not relocatable and must live at that address. That means with the ROM basic card installed, the most memory you can map in is 48K. The Altair had no video card and didn't output a video signal at all, and your only way of interacting with the machine was via some kind of terminal text. We'll be using my vintage VT220A Amber terminal. Thankfully, the Altair can operate at 9600 baud, and some say it'll do 192 with a little tinkering. I've got this board set up for 9600 baud. You select your serial options by wiring together various pads on the board. Next, we'll take a look at the Econoram 4 by CompuKit. I have two of these, and each features 16K of precious system RAM. A base Altair came with only 256 bytes of RAM. You could upgrade the factory RAM board to 4K, but after that, you had to install additional memory cards to make room. These boards feature MM5257N static RAM chips. These boards can run at up to 4 MHz with zero weight states, and since they're static memory, they don't need a dynamic refresh cycle, which makes the circuit design much easier. Each little chip has 4 kilobits of RAM, which means that each row of 8 across is 4 kilobytes. All four rows together then give us our 16K of memory to be found on the card. I'll install both 16K boards at the end of the bus and that will give us our full 32K that we need for prime number generation. It's a far cry from the 120 gigabytes of the Threadripper though. In fact, let's do the math on that. First, let's convert 128 gigabytes to bytes. 128 gigabytes times 1024 megabytes per gigabyte times 1024 kilobytes per megabyte times 1024 bytes per kilobyte comes out to be 137,438,953,472 bytes. Next, we'll convert 32K to bytes. 32K times 1024 bytes per kilobyte, that's 32,768 bytes. Then we just divide the two values together to determine how many times bigger 128 gigabytes is than 32K. We divide the Threadripper memory by the Altair memory to get a ratio, and that tells us that the Threadripper is equipped with more than 4 million times as much RAM as the Altair. Of course, that means that the Threadripper can do things that the Altair absolutely could never hope to do, like calculating primes up to 100 billion in memory. The most we'll get out of the Altair, at least by using Microsoft Basic, are the primes up to about 10,000. But today isn't about excuses, it's about raw horsepower at the limits. And before the Altair can fly, it needs to run. And to get it to run, we need to do a magic dance with the front panel switches. If you've ever been curious what they do, today is your lucky day. Thankfully, it's pretty easy. There are three steps, and they even came printed on this nicely aged index card, so I knew how to boot the machine up even before I knew what I was doing. Let's take a look at what I actually am doing with the switches. The switches on the front of the Altair allow you to do the very fundamentals. Specify an address in binary, display the contents of memory at that address, and deposit a new byte into memory at that address. There are also switches to run the code or reset the machine, but that's largely it. As noted, this Altair has BASIC and ROM, so we're lucky. All we need to do to get the machine ready then is to set the switches to point to the memory address C000 where the ROM lives and then hit run. So let's do that now. First, we power the machine on. Next, to get it into a known state, we raise the stop and reset switches together to reset the machine. We release the reset while stop is still being held, and then release the stop switch. The machine is now paused. To indicate address C000, we convert that into binary and discover that we need to put the left two switches up for one, and all the others stay down at zero. Next, we press examine. And that will show the byte at C000 on the data LEDs. And I know that the first byte of basic is supposed to be F3 hex, which is the 8080 instruction to disable interrupts. Convert it to octal for display on the front panel, I should expect 363, and sure enough, that's precisely what I see. That means we're pointing at the right place. With that, I will lower all the switches and hit run. Within a second or two, I see the famous memory size prompt of Microsoft Basic. So with the machine up and running, we can jump into the terminal and solve some primes. The first thing I'm going to do is to enter new to ensure that the memory is clear, and then I'm going to enter the code for my prime sieve. It's pretty standard Microsoft Basic. It has an outer loop that searches for the next unmarked prime and then walks that prime through the array marking its multiples as non-prime. Finally, with the code entered, I'll type run and press enter. And then, through the magic of editing, I'll just fast forward a little bit. And then a bit more. And then a lot more. Because it took the Altair 240 seconds to crank out an answer. 
Fortunately, the answer was indeed correct. 1,229 primes under 10,000. So my basic chops are intact. And with that, the old time Altair has set the benchmark at 240 seconds. So if the Altair can do it in four minutes, how long will it take the Threadripper? Any guesses? Now I'm not gonna be one of those stooges who says, uh, let me know uh, your guess in the video comments because that would just be lame. But if your jaw drops a little when you see the actual Threadripper results, do let me know because I'm that kind of stooge. Anyway, let's bust out the Threadripper and solve some primes with it. Since I suspect it will go by pretty quickly, what I've actually done is to use one of the solutions from the GitHub Primes project, a C++ sieve where I can specify a limit of 10,000 right on the command line. It will run for five seconds on all cores, solving the primes up to 10,000 on each as many times as it can. And the result? Well, in five seconds, the Threadripper solved the prime set 48,818,443 times in five seconds. Put more simply, where it took the Altair 240 seconds, the Threadripper took one ten millionth of one second. Let's plug those numbers into Excel to see who actually won and by how much. Calculated in passes per second, the Altair mustered 0.004 passes per second versus the Threadripper's 9,763,688 passes per second. Dividing one into the other, we get 2.3 billion. Which is to say that in raw computational output, the Threadripper is more than 2 billion times faster than the Altair. And so, I hereby begrudgingly declare the Threadripper to be the surprise winner by the thinnest of margins. Now, some of you retro computer enthusiasts might be protesting because the Threadripper ran native C++ code, which is pretty much ideal conditions, and the Altair was saddled with a basic interpreter. Hardly fair, right? Well, what if we could actually magically run the Microsoft MS Basic interpreter right on the Threadripper? And thanks to the magic of GitHub, we have access to a project that does precisely that. It's a version of Microsoft's Basic that has been modified to run on Windows, Linux, and the Mac. It's brought to us courtesy the mind of Michael Steele. I'm not even sure that's how you pronounce it, but I'm going to call him Michael Steele anyway, because that would be a cool name. All that really matters is he's clearly some kind of evil super genius, and thanks to a little help from a few friends, he got Basic up and running in C. Now, when I say natively, you have to keep in mind that it's still got the overhead of emulating the C64 and the 6502, not to mention the fact that we're basically asking the Threadripper to stick to a couple of 8-bit registers to get any real work done. And even worse, for every iteration of the sieve, we're going to have to load and launch the entire interpreter each time. Maybe it'll be the Altair's time to shine at last. Sadly, even with all of this overhead, the Threadripper still only took 8 milliseconds per iteration versus the 240 seconds of the Altair, so even running the same interpreter with three hands tied behind its back, and even by the most unfair and conservative estimate that I can muster, the Threadripper is somewhere between 30,000 and 2 billion times faster than the Altair. Well, what then of the Altair's virtues? Well, it's got more dust blinking lights, right? So many. Well, actually, the Threadripper's case has 10 fans with 32 individually addressable LEDs each for a total of at least 320. So I guess not then. But it's got more switches for sure. The Threadripper only has a power switch and a reset button, but the Altair has 25 awesome toggles. So which computer is right for you? Well, it looks like it comes down to what's important to you. Are you looking for a lot of switches? Because if so, the Altair has you covered. For most other cases though, I suppose you might best settle for the Threadripper. If you found today's episode to be any combination of entertaining or informative, I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to my channel. In fact, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. If you have any interest in matters related to Asperger's, ASD, or autism, check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. Ironically, it's got absolutely nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Peaches are coming in mighty early this year. Subscribe. You know what they say, Timmy. Early peaches, long summer. Subscribe. What's that, Lassie? Are you subscribed yet?